Thorsten, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you wonderfully. Thank you, sir. Well, I believe we are ready to go. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us uh, on this somewhat damp day, uh, at least in, uh, in the greater New York City area, for yet another virtual meeting of the Money Marketeers. Uh, today, we're really in for a big treat, uh, not only a personal friend, but really one of the best practitioners of economics, uh, in my opinion, uh, on Wall Street and in global economics today. Torsten Slock will be joining us. Um, I will do my proper introductions and uh, pass the baton over to Torsten if I might just have a moment of housekeeping. Uh, for those of you new to us, we are the Money Marketeers of NYU. And uh, since 1946, the Money Marketeers is counted amongst its membership distinguished financial industry professionals whose common goal is to foster greater understanding of finance and economics among senior practitioners. Uh, in short, our organization puts on events like these and during non-COVID uh, times, uh, in-person dinners with luminaries such as Torsten, uh, and with the hopes of raising money to support students uh, attending the NYU uh, Stern School of Business, and we provide scholarships for them. Uh, so please, if you have interest in joining us, please reach out to anyone on the board uh, or see us at our uh, website. Uh, and therefore, uh, one last uh, bit of housekeeping, our uh, discussion and interview and Q&A with uh, President Tom Barkin from the Richmond Fed is now available both on our website and on our YouTube channels for those of you who were not able to make that uh, call last month. So without further ado, uh, the guest of honor, um, and just a few a few brief words uh, for for our uh, our very esteemed guest. Uh, given Torsten's extensive background in both public and private economics and research, uh, we are very excited to be able to present to you Torsten Slock, the chief econ economist for Apollo Global Management. As a brief uh, brief background prior to joining Apollo, Torsten worked for 15 years on the sell side at Deutsche Bank, where his team was top ranked by institutional investor in fixed income and equities for 10 years including number one just last year in 2019. Previously to that, he worked at the OECD in Paris, in the Money and Finance Division, and in the Structural Policy Analysis Division. And before joining that, he worked at the OEC, before, excuse me, before joining the OECD, apologies, he worked for four years at the IMF um, and the World Economic Outlook in a division responsible for China, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. He studied in the University of Copenhagen and Princeton University, and obviously, we all know him so well from his appearances both on CNBC, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and the FT. Uh, and without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce you to Torsten Slock, who will be giving his presentation today. Torsten, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, the comm should be yours, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for those very kind words. Um, I hope you can uh, see my screen now, Alain. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. So um, thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your kind words here. And it's great to see you again, as always. And thanks for everyone for uh, dialing in today. Uh, so the idea was uh, to give a discussion and a walkthrough of uh, what is the outlook for the US economy? What is the outlook for the Fed? And what is the outlook for financial markets? And the way the, the presentation is organized is uh, relatively simple. Uh, first, I will start out by talking around what are the main conclusions, uh, what are the main findings in the presentation, how, how do we look at the economic outlook, what does that mean for investors. Then I will walk into the three different components of how we arrived at these conclusions, namely first look at the economic data, then look at policy, and then look at market sentiment. And what is the logic with walking through the three different items of first talk about the economic data and policy and market sentiment? Well, the logic is that as an investor, it's not enough to look at the economic data. It's not enough to look at policy. And it's really not enough either to look at market sentiment. You've got to combine these three things together and then have a view on where is the economic data? What's the actions from policy and most importantly, uh, going forward, what's the action that's coming on fiscal policy? What has been the action this year from the Federal Reserve? What does that mean for me as an investor? And finally, is the moving average, if you will, is momentum with me on my view and uh, whatever I think is the investment uh, 
um, alternative that I'm looking at, or are there something in market sentiment that I'm missing? Uh, so in that sense, the broader framework for how uh, we think about uh, whether an investment is a good idea or a bad idea is to try to combine these three different components of economics, what's policy and what's market sentiment doing. And that, from of course, from a very broad perspective, is really the three components of macro investing and therefore the three components of thinking about where is the broader picture for, of course, most importantly, the economy, but ultimately also for financial markets. At the end, I will touch then on what are the investment implications, and this is really uh, repeat in many ways of what I'm going to tell you here up front, namely the main conclusions. So what are the conclusions? Uh, just a short version of um, what is the main finding that I'm going to go through here in the presentation. Well, in very few words, the US economy is slowing, and because of the virus, there's very limited hiring in restaurants, limited hiring in entertainment, in the airline industry. There's very limited hiring across the board in a number of different parts of the economy, simply because those sectors of the economy that are close physical proximity industries, they are simply just still, unfortunately, being held back by the virus. So one very simple observation is that if we are not hiring back to where we were in February in restaurants, hotels, airlines, elsewhere in face-to-face -face industries, then of course that puts a limit to how much of an increase in employment we can get going forward. We had, as we'll see in a moment, we had a nice rebound initially, but now we're beginning to flatten out. And this is the worry we have is that we're getting to the most slow pace part of the recovery, simply because the virus is still dominating so much most importantly, again, in those industries that have been impacted so hard by the virus. The second reason why the economic data also is being impacted by the virus is because of what I have written as the next sentence, namely childcare and nursing home closures are also holding back hiring. And what do I mean by that? Well, at the moment, as you know, a lot of schools and a lot of nursing homes and a lot of family members, of course, that people have, young or old, uh, unfortunately not able to go back to school or go back to nursing homes and therefore have to be taken care of. And this is unfortunately also having some implications. We've seen that in a number of European countries that when schools open up, and of course also in certain states in the US where we've had more reopening of schools relative to others, but those places where these problems of taking care of family members have been solved, you have also seen a faster rebound more generally. So the second reason why we unfortunately still expect the data to be weaker in the near term is because of the problems and the challenges. I'll show you some numbers in a second in terms of what are the issues from a childcare and nursing home perspective. So the bottom line is we really need to solve the problem of this virus before we can get the economy all the way back to where we were in February. And unfortunately, again, in a significant part of the economy, in particular, again, as I've listed here, face-to-face -face industries, you still have the issue that hiring will probably not go back before we have some solution to the vaccine. And similarly, many people can't go to work because they have to take care of family members. So therefore, the main conclusion from an economic perspective is that they, we had a nice, somewhat V-shaped rebound initially. The knee-jerk reaction was to get a lot of hiring back very quickly. But um, for now, uh, going forward, uh, the trajectory is flattening out. Uh, one way to think about this is the Nike swoosh where you have a quick rebound and then you see the Nike swoosh begin to move more sideways going forward. And that's why we come to the conclusion that for the next few months and maybe all the way into the first quarter of 2021, you should expect relatively weak numbers on employment growth. We've already seen employment growth start to slow down. So employment growth of 600,000 has been nice last month, but it's just not enough to bring us all the way back to where we were in February. You should also expect relatively weak GDP growth, relatively weak CapEx spending, and in particular in the industries that are still hard hit, you should also expect hiring and GDP more broadly over the next uh, four to six months to be unfortunately more slow growing and therefore very popularly speaking, moving more sideways relative to what we've seen over the last six months. What are the risks to this economic view? Well, of course, the number one risk is a vaccine. Uh, if we get a vaccine faster, of course, that will create a rebound faster. Uh, Dr. Fauci now says that we should expect a vaccine in April. Uh, and here he's talking about widespread availability. So that, of course, brings some confidence that maybe we could see growth by the second quarter, maybe by the middle of next year look better. But remember that April is still six months away from where we are to today. So that means from a market perspective, that means that we are at risk of having a more volatile environment for the next uh, three, six months until 
we get more evidence whether we will have a vaccine that's functioning and whether people want to take it and whether it's effective enough and when this will be widespread available for the broader population, not only in the US, but of course also more globally. But this, of course, is a very, very important issue, namely a vaccine coming faster, coming slower, can of course move around this baseline forecast of uh, GDP growth being weaker over the next uh, four to six months. Fiscal stimulus is, of course, the other significant risk to the outlook. Uh, we are literally watching here as we speak constantly whether we will get a deal in the near term or before the election. Uh, we are moving closer to the baseline scenario that we should probably not expect much fiscal stimulus until after the election. And one maybe likely scenario is that maybe we shouldn't expect something until after January the 20th. If we do get a blue wave, then we will have to wait, of course, um, for Biden to begin as president and the new Congress to begin. And that, of course, means that it will probably take some time before we eventually see the positive uh, impact on the economy. Uh, and here again, we are back to discussing that that might only come and begin to lift GDP probably sometime in the second quarter or in the middle of next year, which again also suggests that we now have uh, three, six months again ahead of us where things could be a bit more weak on the economic data and potentially therefore also be volatile, more volatile in financial markets. Number three, of course, is the virus coming back. And number four, of course, are the risks around whether the election and will we have a hung election and what could be the outcomes around some of the issues that have been debated so much in markets or, of course, over the last month or so. But the main conclusion is these risks, certainly number one and two, are significant risks to the upside. But in terms of timing, it looks like those risks, it might take at least a little while before we get them to begin to have an impact on GDP overall. So what are the investment implications? Just in a few words. Well, inflation and rates will stay low for many years. Uh, the Fed has very clearly said we'll keep rates low until at least 2023. The Fed continues to be very dovish. The Fed continues to send very strong signals that they're now thinking a little bit more about whether they also want to step up purchases further out the yield curve, if there is a risk that long rates have been moving up more recently, what are the implications of that? And will we see maybe some more shifting towards the long end in terms of QE or Fed purchases? This all, in our view, argues again for the main conclusion, at least where we stand right now, namely that inflation will definitely not be a problem when you have a significant output gap, when you have such a high level of unemployment at 7.9 still. Uh, the Fed dovishness also speaks for itself and the front end of rates also staying low. So therefore, we feel quite strongly that rates and inflation will just be low for a very extended period. And this is really also what the Fed is saying again when they keep on emphasizing that rates are not going up until at least at the earliest 2023. What does that mean? Well, that means that the regime we have had now for a while, namely the hunt for yield, is going to continue. That means that stock and credit selection will continue to be key, in particular given the uncertainty about the virus. The virus came along and of course, made some significant impacts on how investing has been done for many years. People really didn't think about this dimension or in quant language, the virus was a whole new factor. If you had a quant model and were running regressions looking back uh, 20, 30 years, you just didn't have this variable on your right hand side in your model. So that means that now suddenly the consideration for which companies have done well was no longer about which companies have high leverage or high revenue growth or which companies have high R&D spending. It was really a whole new dimension that has become so extremely important, which is why uh, a lot of the quant frameworks have been a bit challenged here uh, during COVID, simply because it's been so difficult to deal with this issue that this was a whole new factor that was so difficult to quantify. That again brings it back to the conclusion that I've written here in stock and credit selection does become very important when you think about a whole new force coming in and looking forward. It of course also is very important. If you think we have a vaccine very quickly, then of course you should be buying those parts of the economy, airlines, hotel, leisure and hospitality. If you think a vaccine is going to take a lot longer, of course, then it's going to take longer for those industries also to come back. Finally, weaker growth over the coming months means more volatility in markets. I mentioned that. And of course, that's the risk that if the economic data is moving more sideways or in the worst case if the unemployment rate now actually begins to go up over the next several months then of course we will all get a fairly significant surprise and the fed will certainly be having to change their tone in an even more dovish direction if there is an increase in the unemployment rate before we get a vaccine 
or before we get the fiscal stimulus. So with that, let me now just spend um, a bit of time on then talking about the economic backdrop, then I'll talk about policy, and then I'll talk about market sentiment. And the economic backdrop, yes. of course, is, as I just mentioned, that we lost a lot of jobs during, of course, uh, the period from February to April, and we have brought back and regained some of these jobs. As you can see in February, total employment in the US economy was 152 million jobs. It dropped by 22 million down to 130 million. And we have basically uh, regained about half of those jobs. The fear you can have, as the chart shows, is that it was a nice rebound for the first month when we were coming out of the hole. But as you can see, and as I mentioned in the beginning, we've been moving more sideways more recently. And unfortunately, this is happening at a relatively low level simply because there's still a lot of industries that are now still challenged by the virus where you should not expect to see any meaningful job growth before we have. Uh, vaccine and before we had the virus behind us. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Federal Reserve has looked at this in various forms and the St. Louis Fed has uh, a lot of work done on this issue of how many workers are we talking about that are still being impacted by in, in industries by the virus still being around. And one way to do that is to try to look at what is the proximity index. In other words, what is the amount of uh, uh, workers that are in industries where people are close to each other, for example, uh, hotels, uh, airlines, uh, hairdressers, um, Uber drivers, uh, taxi drivers. And what the Fed calculated, as you can see in this table here, is that if you look in the uh, column uh, uh, second from right, it shows you that uh, 27 million workers have uh, jobs in an industry where you have a high proximity and here a high close physical proximity index. So that's another way of saying 27 million workers are in industries that are probably still going to be impacted quite substantially as long as the virus is still with us. And as you can see to the right, that's about 22% of the US workforce. And what industries are those? As I've written at the bottom, that's healthcare. This is leisure and hospitality, teachers and motor vehicle operators. Teachers, of course, plays a little bit special role, but broadly speaking, there's, of course, a lot of different industries, as we all know too well, that unfortunately will not see any significant job growth anytime soon, simply because they are face-to-face -face or close physical proximity industries that, of course, has a lot of issues associated with it. The other issue I mentioned from the beginning is that it's not only about industries where people are close to each other. It's also the more, say, practical issue that we all have family members and some have family members that are kids, some have family members that are older generations. And the question becomes, well, where are we in terms of capacity in daycare institutions? Where are we in terms of capacity in nursing homes? And the blue line here, just as an example, shows your employment in child daycare services. And as you can see, Employment in child daycare services is, is down still around 17% from where it was in February. And there are various ways, and there's enough different statistics that looks at how many daycare centers are closed and how many schools are closed and how many nursing homes are closed. But the main conclusion here is, as you can clearly see, we've had a much bigger drop in child daycare service employment, telling you clearly that there's still a lot of daycare centers that are not open. Some indicators suggest that, depending on exactly how you measure this, but some suggest that we only have about 70% of uh, child daycare centers open at the moment. But the bottom line is, as long as we still have challenges with getting our kids into daycare centers, then more people have to stay home. And if that's the case, that's quote unquote easy if you have a service sector job where you sit in front of a computer every day. But if you work at a restaurant, if you clean at a hotel, if you have many jobs, you work at an airline, it's just not possible to work uh, if you have of course, to stay home in your local daycare center or for older generations, the nursing home for your parents or grandparents is still closed. So that's, of course, also still a very important impact from the virus that's also holding back the recovery in a very significant way. And one very distinct feature of the employment growth we have seen is, and this is making us a bit more worried more recently, is that initially, a lot of the job losses were indeed in sectors that I have mentioned several times, again, restaurants, airlines, hotels, a lot of the service sectors. And what this chart here shows is employment in uh, different parts of the economy here split by how many people are employed in sectors that make more than average hourly earnings, which is $29, and how many people are employed in sectors that make less 
that the average hourly earnings mini again twenty nine dollars. And if you look at the green line, it shows your employment in jobs paying less than twenty nine dollars an hour. That dropped a lot, as you could see, from February to April. We've seen a steady recovery again, a significant V shape initially from April to June, and then more sideways movement. What is more worrying is in the blue line. Have a look at what happened from August to September. You've actually seen employment in jobs that pay more than twenty nine dollars an hour move more sideways. And you see the same picture when you look at employment by education. Here, the green line is now what is total employment for people who have a bachelor's degree. And if you look at the green line at the top, you can see that that actually also declined from August to September. It's likewise, in the blue line, people that are employed that have less than a bachelor's degree, but more than a high school diploma, that actually also declined. So you're beginning to look at a situation where there is uh, this fear that maybe we're seeing a trickling up effect that the virus is no longer just hitting people who are working at restaurants. The virus is actually also beginning to have implications for middle managers. There's a lot of anecdotes about this also in the news at the moment. And this is the fear you can have going forward. If we do not get a fiscal stimulus, if we do not get a vaccine, you should be watching these two arrows that I've been putting in here. What are the job situations for people that have higher skills and higher education? Because the latest data point we have has been pointing more to the downside. And this, of course, opens up a broader discussion about which parts of the economy are doing well, which parts are not doing well. Uh, this chart here shows you what is employment in different sectors today relative to where it was in February. So look at the top line in February, non-farm payrolls, meaning total employment in the US economy was 100. It dropped in April down to 85, meaning we see, saw a 15% decline in employment overall. It rebounded nicely up to 93 in August, but it actually moved sideways in September. So again, the uh, six, 700,000 jobs we created in September, it wasn't really enough to lift us up higher. As you can see, we're still 7% below where we were in February. And what's most interesting in particular from an equity and credit perspective is the ranking of which parts of the economy have been rebounding more and which parts of the economy have not been rebounding. Look at the top lines here, performing arts and spectator sports, motion picture and sound recording industries, seating and sightseeing, transportation, amusement, gambling, recreation. If you go further down, leisure and hospitality, air transportation. Some of these sectors have just not rebounded at all. Other parts of this, as you can see, let's look at air transportation. It's rebounded nicely, but it's still at 79, which means that we're still basically 20% lower in employment relative to where in February. And the risk, of course, at a lot of these industries is that, again, if it takes time for the virus to come back, is that it will still take more time for these companies to rehire workers. And this, of course, is a very important perspective from an equity perspective. If you look at this or credit perspective, which of these sectors are doing well, which sectors are not doing well. And it's pretty clear, as you can see, that there's some sectors that have benefited a little bit more. And from a relative value perspective, you could use this table to compare the rebound on an equity or credit perspective in different parts of credit markets or equity markets compared to what has actually been happening on the real economy side. And on the other side of this table, of course, at the bottom, you have the industries down here that have been doing well during COVID. And this is not a surprise, careers and messages, building material and gun supply stores, warehousing and storage, this is online delivery. So this table here basically gives you some idea that this is not an economy where everything is moving around in sync the way that we normally do. But this just tells you very clearly that there are some still very significant differences across the board in how different companies in different sectors have been doing. Similarly, if you look at the consumer, we've also had some very significant differences, obviously. And one very important difference, of course, relative to what we normally have seen, is that there was a significant fiscal stimulus with the CARES Act that was helping the consumer very, very significantly through the last six, seven months. This chart here shows you the green bar is the monthly savings for the household sector. And as you can see, during the blue bars, we got from the CARES Act, this was the $600 unemployment benefits and the $1,200 stimulus checks. We got a significant lift in savings for the household sector. So if you accumulate the blue bars together where we stand right now, that means that we have roughly a little bit more than a trillion in pent up demand or in savings in the household sector, simply because people go, couldn't go to restaurants, they couldn't travel, they couldn't stay at hotels. So therefore the savings rate has gone up spectacularly. And that means that today, a bullish argument for the consumer and a very important reason why consumption has done so well is because savings have gone up so much. And we saw this in retail sales data last week. This is a retail sales, so this is retail sales control, but broadly speaking, consumption and consumer spending has been going up very significantly. And you might look at this chart and say, wow, I thought we had a big recession. Why is consumption so strong? And the answer to that is that consumption has been so strong exactly because of the savings rate going up 
so significantly. So the consumer has been doing relatively well, but there's a lot of course discussion and you can get quite worried that with the unemployment rate still at 7.9, if we do not get another fiscal expansion, that the implication of this could of course, over the next several months until we get a fiscal expansion, become more negative. One area where this has also shown up is in credit quality. And credit quality means what are people's ability to pay their auto loans? What are people's ability to service their credit card loans? And what are people's ability to pay their mortgages? And this chart here shows you very simply that if you look at the percentage of accounts in hardship in auto loans, credit cards, and mortgages, it's measured a little bit differently. But the main message in this chart here is that across all FICO scores, we have actually seen impressive performance in securitized credit cards, securitized auto loans, and in mortgages. And this is driven again very importantly by the fiscal expansion supporting the US consumer overall. That doesn't mean, to be clear, that, that the US consumer is in great shape everywhere across the board. There are certainly some very important differences across the income spectrum in terms of how COVID has been hitting. To the left here, you see what is the impact of COVID-19 on your household? And this is by income. And to the left, you see low-income households. And as you can see, the different colored bars here shows you laws. Did you lose health insurance? Have you had trouble paying for medical care? Problem paying rent and mortgage? Borrowed money from family and friends? Used money from savings and retirement accounts? And trouble paying bills? And it's very clear that uh, there's been a very uneven hit to the consumer sector, which is, of course, why those households to the left have unfortunately been much harder hit by COVID. Of course, they got help from the CARES Act, but again, broadly speaking, uh, this is now no longer a support for the economy, and that's why this fiscal discussion is such an important driver of what's going on in financial markets. You've also seen a rebound in actual spending levels across the income distribution, as shown in this chart here. Uh, the green line shows you what is card spending here, both debit card and credit card spending look like for low-income group in the green line, for middle-income groups in the blue line, and high-income groups in the yellow line. And you can see this come back nicely for everyone. Uh, the yellow line is still below the index 100, which is where we were before COVID. Uh, so this probably speaks to the consumption patterns of high-income groups doing more travel, more hotels, uh, more leisure, and even maybe with more restaurants, if you look at it from the expenditure survey from, from uh, the PLS. But the main conclusion still here is that uh, it's moving more towards a normalization, but still it's very important that the broader outlook for consumers is indeed no longer as dire as it was earlier, but going forward, it still depends a lot on the fiscal uh, support that might be coming along. One interesting aspect of this is to look at consumer confidence. Uh, the blue line is what gets most attention. People are asked, uh, what's your present situation for consumer confidence? That dropped a lot. Uh, the yellow is the combination of the green and, and um, of the green and the blue. Uh, but look at the green expectations. Quite interestingly, expectations really didn't drop when COVID came along. Everyone uh, here, consumers, and this is actually across the income spectrum and various demographics of ages and, and various dimensions, you still saw the same pattern everywhere. Consumers really did see this as temporary. The green light didn't go down. It was not the case that consumers said that oh, my expectations to the future have deteriorated dramatically. You saw much bigger decline in the blue line than what you saw in the green line. And you've seen some of the same also in the corporate space among CEOs. Here, this chart here shows you, this is the conference board had a survey where they asked in the blue line, uh, what are current conditions at the moment? And the green line is, what do you expect in the future? And normally people argue that today is very similar to the future. So the green and the blue line move together. But for this period, as you can see, we've seen a significant divergence where the blue line, people, people talking about today, people say today is not good. But the green line is actually saying, but in six months, everything will be fine. It will actually be back at the peaks that we had for the last 10 years. So there's some very important differences in how people look at today relative to the future that you're seeing not only for consumers, and also, but also for CEOs in the corporate space. And this gives you some confidence that there is some optimism that these things are temporary and things will get better going forward eventually once the virus is behind us. The problem is that for the corporate sector, if you look at the home-based data here for small businesses, for the corporate sector, you have seen still a more sideways movement. This chart here is the number of small businesses that are open in the green line. The blue line is where employees are working and the yellow line is hours worked. So what the home base uh, data is doing, that home base measures, this is a payroll. 
the scheduling service. So in other words, companies schedule through home base, how many people are working, are we open, how many hours do they work? So this data basically shows you that small businesses that are getting service from home base, there's about 70,000 small businesses, they have actually not seen any improvement for the last several months, which makes you a bit worried about what the implications are for smaller businesses relative to bigger businesses. And you see this business uncertainty also show up in the Atlanta Fed as a survey where they ask about business uncertainty. And you can see here, this is asking about sales revenue growth in the green line and employment growth uncertainty in the blue line. And you can see it's been improving a little bit, but we're still at relatively elevated levels. Again, telling you that business uncertainty is still with us despite the stock market and everything that we normally look at in markets, there's still some fundamental uncertainties and still some fundamental risks that people worry about, in particular, of course, in the business space and in particular, again, in the small and medium-sized enterprises. And this is also what you have seen if you look at the Yelp data, looking at in which sectors of the economy have we seen business closures. And it's not a surprise, this chart here, if you look at the text below the title, this is business closures by 1,000 businesses since March 1. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that those businesses that have closed. So to be clear, what this shows is that on Yelp, you can mark a business whether it's closed, whether it's temporarily closed, or whether it's open. And you can see that breakfast and brunch and hamburger, sandwiches, gift shops, men's clothing, home decor, food trucks. These are, of course, the industries that have been particularly hard hit. And of course, these are the industries that, of course, still now are waiting for the virus to go away before we should see more empowering and more employment come back. And again, unfortunately, a lot of these sectors that, that we're talking about here are small and medium-sized enterprises. And this, of course, has also shown up in tourist and, and tourist data and tourism more broadly. And this chart here, this is a little bit of a side issue, but nevertheless gives a good picture of uh, the broader situation from a, a both a particular restaurant and niche and hospitality perspective. This shows you the average daily pedestrian count in Times Square. And as you can see, if you compare the September data with where we were 12 months ago, we are still only at 25% of normal. And this is really not a surprise. If you look at other indicators for New York City, how many people take the subway, it's still only 25% of what it would be normally on this day 12 months ago. Likewise, Long Island Railroad, everything that has to do with Grand Central and Metro North, all these indicators basically still show that uh, there's still a lot of people that are not uh, commuting, going out to restaurants, going out shopping, but basically working from home. And again, as long as the virus is here, it's pretty clear that these um, uh, issues, of course, continue to have a significant impact on the economy. We are seeing a little bit of better data when you look at the air travel during holidays data. Uh, this chart here shows you what was air travel during uh, various holidays here in 2020 when we've had the pandemic. As you can see, the green bar has been going up. But look just at the holiday we had Columbus Day here just uh, 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 earlier this week or last week. And as you can see, we're not quite back anywhere to the level we were in 2019. We're actually only a third of that. But we are still moving in the right direction. So it's moving forward. But the, the message is that um, people are still quite worried. And one area where you really see this is the data from the conference board where they asked, uh, consumers, are you planning to go on vacation? And as you can see here, uh, those who say yes, we're planning to go on vacation. The yellow bar is those who say we're planning to go on vacation by airplane. And the blue bar is those who say yeah, we're planning to go on vacation by in our car. And you have seen again a pretty significant divergence. The, the positive news in this chart here is that the blue line is actually going up. The blue bar is going up. So more people are planning to go on vacation. But um, the problem is that um, it is still, of course, very important what the virus is doing and how people think about the virus before people start coming back and going more significantly on vacation and doing travel more broadly. Finally, on the economic data, uh, one issue, and Alain, had, we had this also in the title, and I'll come back to this uh, at the end. Uh, but one thing, when we talk about inflation, and I said in the beginning, we have a lot of excess capacity in the economy, so there is not much sign of inflation at the moment. One very just quick chart on this, of course, is that we should not forget that when you look at this chart in the conference board, there is a question asking people, what do you think inflation will be over the next, next 12 months? And it's quite fascinating, in particular, when you work in financial markets to look at this chart, because as you can see, whenever you have a recession, it's always the case that people say, oh, we're gonna have a lot of inflation, we're gonna have a lot of inflation. Uh, and the answer, as you can see, is that, well, normally people calm down and say, oh, well, maybe we will not have that much inflation. So we can debate when we'll have inflation and when we'll get back to full capacity. But this chart here is just an important reminder that um, we should be aware that there is always uh, a lot of uh, 
psychology and how people think about inflation, how the Fed is doing a lot of uh, purchases and they're doing a lot of QE that must create inflation. This has, in particular in 2008 and 2009, again and again, been a very important part of the debate. But that debate begins to die down eventually. And we also expect that to be the case this time around. That doesn't mean that rates are not going up. That's very important, but it just means that the inflation debate is at least sometimes driven a lot more by people, quite frankly, almost panicking during recessions and beginning to worry about things that might be happening. And then that doesn't happen and they get their expectations down again. Finally, let me spend just a few pages and then I'll stop and um, have a discussion with Alain, namely first about policy and then about market sentiment. And one thing that's very, very important to understand about policy is that the Fed obviously has played an extremely important role in stabilizing uh, the fall in the economy and also ultimately in stabilizing financial markets. And one way to look at what the impact has been of Fed action is this chart here. So the green line shows you the level of the high yield index. Look at what that did in the last six, seven months. Of course, the Fed stepped in in credit markets and started buying IT corporate bonds, started buying fallen angels. They haven't bought as much uh, compared to the impact they have had on markets overall. But the fact that they stepped in and said, we will support markets, as you can see very clearly, has pushed spread down and pushed the level of yields down very significantly. So corporate bond markets are open. Anyone who wants to issue in corporate bond markets, very broadly speaking, can do that and the level of yield that that is done at is very low. The issue now is, if you look at the yellow and the blue line, this is the Fed Senior Loan Officer Survey. This is asking banks, are you tightening credit conditions? In this case, are you tightening credit conditions on CNI loans? CNI loans, of course, means commercial and industrial loans. So this means, are you tightening credit conditions on loans to corporates? And the yellow line is to large firms. The blue line is to small firms. You can't see the blue line is hidden behind the yellow line. But the main conclusion here is that banks, and the data goes up to Q3, have tightened credit conditions quite significantly. And this is really at the core of the problem for the recovery now. If I am a big company and I would like to issue a lot of debt and I need liquidity to stay afloat, I need money now for uh, whatever I might need money for as a big corporate to pay my bills, to pay my workers that I have, then uh, the markets are totally open and you can get credit, you can get funding. But the problem is that a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises are dependent on the banking sector. And as you can see in the yellow and the blue line, the banking sector have tightened credit conditions. And remember in the US economy overall, if you look at the ADP data and the census data, companies that have less than a thousand employees, if you take their employment combined, accounts for half of employment in the US economy. So in other words, half of employment in the US economy is small and medium-sized enterprises. That means that small and medium-sized businesses are a very important part of the recovery going forward. And if small and medium-sized businesses do not have access to borrowing, if they can't borrow and stay liquid and pay their workers and pay their bill and pay their rents, of course, then they will have problems and this will begin to open up challenges in particular for small and medium-sized businesses. Of course, PPP program was one solution to this to try to support small and medium-sized businesses. But as we know too well, the employment numbers haven't really rebounded for small businesses in a very significant way either. So the big challenge, of course, from a policy perspective is that there was significant help to corporate bond markets, but it was just a lot harder to help small and medium-sized businesses because of the challenges with getting money out to the, the census data. Would, if you look at that, there are various ways of counting the number of small businesses in the US, but in the census data, would say that the census numbers say there's around 20 million small businesses and getting money very quickly out to them was a great challenge, of course, for policymakers. That's why, as a footnote, the Fed is now, and also the ECB, but central banks are now beginning to think about, can we create digital currencies? Can we create ways of getting money out much faster in the future if we do have a similar situation where we need to get money into the hands of people who need to spend it? And that, of course, is a way of trying to think about what are the solutions to the problem that we have had for the last six, seven months, and the problem also we have at the moment. And the final chart here shows you, this is not only for corporates, this is, asking the questions to banks, are you tightening credit conditions on credit cards? And as you can see here, banks also have tightened credit conditions. As I've written in the text box, banks started tightening credit card lending standards before the pandemic. It was already the case before the pandemic came around because there was a lot of issues with auto loans and other types of lending where you had seen credit standards already begin to tighten a bit more. But of course, the pandemic pushed us up closer to levels that we've had earlier. And this, of course, also becomes a problem when you start thinking about, well, we'd like to have some more consumption. We'd like to have credit flowing so that people can borrow. And unfortunately, as you can see in this chart here, credit standards have been tightening quite significantly overall. Another way of looking at this from a market perspective is to look just specifically at credit markets 
This chart here shows you, if you look at the textbook on the title, this is a triple B corporate bond effective yield minus the single A corporate bond effective yield. So this is basically the quality spread. What's going on inside the IG index in terms of how does the market differentiate between high quality IG relative to low quality, lower quality IG? And as you can see, we've seen a significant spread compression where the market is having less differentiation. And this, of course, is opening up debates about, well, was this driven by the Fed? Was this driven by fundamentals? We've had significant increase in issuance at Triple B over the last many years and also in the last six months. What does that mean in terms of how people think about what is the critical across the spectrum? But it's pretty clear that we've had a significant narrowing, which of course has been very helpful for everyone issuing in corporate bonds. And the final point on this is of course, to look at the change in corporate bond deals since the beginning of the year. The Fed very clearly said, we are buying in the IG and in the full natures and the higher quality credit. And that of course has been implying therefore that the, the corporate bond deals have of course been coming down in the higher quality credits to the left. And this has of course created a very different picture in the double B and single B and the triple Cs. And so the main conclusion is, as I've written in the title here, Fed, Fed purchases have been distorting the cost of capital across the capital structure. That's not really surprising. If the Fed says, we're only going to buy this in the credit market and not that, then, of course, those things that they buy will get more support. And that's, of course, what you see in this picture here overall. And that has meant that now, overall, the level of yields has come down. Uh, and therefore, the level, of course, uh, the spreads have also come down, as I just showed you in some of these charts. Well, that means that now, if you look at and this is a little bit unusual way of looking at things, but if you look at the spread, in this case in high yield, divided by the level of the yield in high yield, you get that high yield today is essentially all about the spread. In other words, normally investors in credit, uh, they think about, do I wanna be buying the level of the index, meaning the yield, or am I betting on this spread in credit? And normally that has been a very important discussion, whether you were invested in the spread or in the level of the yield, but today, as you can see, now everything that's going on in IG and high yield and across loans in the most parts of, of, um, of the credit space at the moment, up and down the capital structure, really is very much driven entirely by the spread. And this is just a different way of saying that the level of rates has come down significantly. But this does become important when you think about using very broadly fixed income in your portfolio, when you use it as a proxy for other things you have in portfolio, as proxy for hedge and rates, all these debates will have about 60, 40 in terms of investing more broadly. Fixed income and the fixed income spread product has really changed quite substantially because of all the Fed action and because of the level of the rates coming down so much. Let me end uh, before I stop with just a few slides on market sentiment. Uh, one thing that of course gets a lot of attention and where market sentiment is at the moment, this chart here shows you uh, how big a share of debt is trading in negative yields. And this specifically chart shows you the amount in dollar terms of bonds globally that trade at negative interest rates. And as you can see at the moment, we're back to close to the peak that we had in 2019 of $17 trillion in bonds that are trading in negative yields. This is of course the number one reason why there's so much hunt for yield, because as rates continue to go lower globally, this of course is a very important driver of why people continue to hunt yield and continue to push things down overall in fixed income and in spread product. So I skipped a few pages there, but I wanna make sure we have enough discussion with Alain in a minute. But the investment vacations from this of course feed directly into what is going on in financial markets. And I think this chart here is one of the most important charts for any investor when you think about financial markets and what's going on. What's going on if you start to the left is that you have risk-free assets. Uh, the safest asset in the world is the Fed funds rate. You are absolutely guaranteed to get your money back if you buy the Fed funds rate overnight. And that's of course um, what is the, if you will, the, the risk-free or the safe haven asset uh, that you can always go to. Of course, the return in that is now literally zero. It's basically very low and it's likely to continue to be so for quite some time. So what have people been doing? Well, you can go and buy then, of course, duration. You can buy 10-year rates. Now the Fed has been doing QE and 10-year rates have also dropped down so much. So risk-free assets, the Fed funds rate, the 10-year rate, or the whole treasury curve is now so unattractive from an investing perspective that people are hunting yield further to the right in investment grade credit. If you want more, you can buy, of course, uh, uh, securitized auto loans, credit cards, and mortgages. You could buy high yield, as I have here. If that's not enough, you could buy equities. And if that is not enough, you could buy emerging markets. And of course, over the last 10 years, this has been the one big trade that everyone in markets have been having on, namely, you should simply just go more to the right in this chart here. And of course, US equities have done incredibly well over the last 10 years. And that, of course, has been driven very importantly by 
the fact that the risk-free asset, think back to your MBA textbook, the risk-free asset, when that's unattractive, of course, people start hunting you to the right. And why is this? And this, of course, is trivial for all of us who, of course, and on this call here and everyone who normally thinks about financial markets, because this has been the theme and the pattern for a very long time. What's interesting in this chart here is what I have tried to write at the bottom, namely, what are the risks that the hunt for yield could end? Or as I've written in the title, what can reverse the ongoing hunt for yield? What can it reverse this idea that all you have to do as an investor is to move to the right? And in the last 10 years, just by U.S. equities, because that was basically the best performing asset, in at least in dollar terms. Well, there are two key issues to think about, and that's what I've been try trying to put in the, the text box below. Namely, first of all, look to the left under the Fed funds rate and the 10-year rates. What could move the Fed funds rate up? Either higher inflation or more government debt or a lower dollar. And what do I mean by that? Well, higher inflation obviously would put the, the Fed funds rate up because then the Fed will be forced to increase rates and we will suddenly have a much higher risk-free rate, which might imply that people over to the right will begin to say, hey, like we saw in 2018, when the Fed put the risk-free rate up to two and a half, three percent, and they said that rates were going to go up further, a lot of people started saying, well, why should I be having credit or S&P or emerging markets if I can get uh, two, three, four, five percent of the risk-free rate? So higher inflation, so we do not expect that, but higher inflation is a very important driver of why the risk-free rate goes up. More government debt, what's the problem with this? Well, the more you increase your government debt, the more you need to monitor treasury auctions. You need to look at what's going on with the bid to cover ratio, what's going up with how much is taken down by primary dealers, by foreign participants. Because if you have a situation where fiscal expansion increases government debt, you need to monitor how treasury auctions are going when the supply goes up so much. Because at some point, and this is the textbook from emerging markets, at some point, if you print, quote unquote, too much money and from a fiscal perspective and you had too much issuance, the risk, of course, begins to appear that there will not be enough demand. And the first place that we'll be looking for this is, of course, in treasury auctions. So more government debt could push up 10-year rates, which, of course, and we can begin debating whether this is what's going on in 10-year rates at the moment or not. So we do not expect this, of course, to become unanchored at all. But there probably is some normalization as a result of the expectation of more issuance of treasuries that could therefore be pushing rates up. And how much rates go up will then be also determining, again, the appetite among investors. If you see 10-year rates go up, what would then the appetite be for investors for buying risk-free assets to the right in this arrow chart here? And finally, the dollar. Remember that 40% of treasuries is held by foreigners. Remember that a third of IG and, and credit is held by foreigners. And that data just came out actually just in the last few days that 40% of equities is held by foreigners. So foreigners is actually pretty important for U.S. financial markets. And that's why the dollar, of course, if that starts to go down, that would also be the textbook sort of IMF emerging market style problem that if foreigners begin to lose appetite for U.S. assets, that, of course, would also be something that could have consequences for what would happen to, of course, the Fed funds rate through inflation, but also treasury rates further out the curve. So the number one risk is the risk-free rate going up because in a finance textbook university, the risk-free rate goes up, it creates risk to risky assets. And the final second thing that you should, of course, worry about is deteriorating credit fundamentals, lack of earnings growth, or just put it very simply, if the recovery is weak, can we still sustain a PE multiple for the S&P 500 that's a, a 21, 22, or are there risks that uh, this could begin to see the E and the PE ratio go down, and therefore also investors begin to ask questions about maybe valuations are too high. So the two key, key risks to the hunt for yield that we're seeing at the moment is either the risk-free rate going up or earnings and fundamentals, or therefore the broader GDP picture being weaker and therefore no longer justifying the expected cash flow that's priced in to the S&P 500 and priced in to credit markets. Let me end with the final slide, and then I will stop and turn it over to Alain. Uh, well, you might ask, okay, so what are the consequences of this, other than what I mentioned at the beginning? Well, there are, of course, some important considerations to make as an investor at the moment, namely, in very simple words, are we early cycle or are we still in a recession? If we are still in a recession, of course, this has significant implications. And therefore, if you think that we still have weak growth for the next several months, again, three, six months, then you should think about asset allocation as in still in a recessionary mode. If you think we're early cycle, then of course, you might begin to take some more risk. And what are the dimensions? Well, of course, long duration versus short duration, high quality or low quality credit, 
growth versus value, yields versus dividends, and here again, bonds versus equities, U.S. assets and non-U.S. assets, and finally, liquid assets versus illiquid assets. So these, of course, are dimensions that one should be thinking about in terms of where are we in the cycle? Do I think that this is a time to begin to allocate more to the early cycle pattern? Okay, then it's obvious what should be done. Or do I still think that it's a little bit too early because we are still in a recession? And let me therefore end with the final slide, Amy, as I had here. What are the conclusions? As I said at the bottom, inflation and rates will stay low for many years. The Fed is dovish. We take the hunt for yield will continue. We are monitoring these risks to the hunt for yield, as I mentioned before. And finally, weaker growth over the coming months means more volatility in markets. And of course, credit and stock selection is absolutely key, given this new factor of the virus that has been coming along. So with that, let me turn it back to you, Alain, and um, see what questions are coming in. Thank you very much, Torsten. That was... That was great. That really was. We sincerely appreciate that. And uh, by way of uh, just a, a quick update, uh, you should have a question box available to you on your dashboard. I know a lot of you have already been uh, asking questions and they have been coming quite honestly, Torsten, quite fast and furious. So uh, an interest of trying to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, and obviously, if it requires a longer answer, so be it. But uh, we do have a few questions out there. So without too much further ado. Are you ready to uh, to jump in? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, starting off really with what one of the last thoughts that you were talking about vis-a-vis -vis credit. Um, how does that, uh, this is one of the questions that are coming in, how does that ABBB spread compare to the 2008-2009 uh, recessionary cycle that, that was the last real big blow up for the economy? Yeah. So, uh... In many ways, this is a very important question because it touches on a lot of the different things uh, that we have spoken about. First of all, the spread, of course, on Triple B has been coming in, and you can sit and compare that where we were in 2008 and 9. But the stock of Triple B outstanding is much, much higher today, and the share of Triple B in the index of IG is much higher today. Roughly, in round numbers, roughly half of the IG investment grade credit index is now Triple B. Uh, during the financial crisis, this was closer to roughly around a third. So that's why we've seen a significant increase in issuance, significant increase in appetite. And that's not problematic as such. It just means that remember, Triple B get, gets closer to becoming an issue when you think about where the difference is between investment grade credit and high yield credit. So the short answer to that is that, uh, yes, it's true that the IG spread today is narrow relative to where it was in 2009, but a lot of that has been driven by the Fed action. It's been driven by markets basically relying on the Fed saying that uh, we will support credit markets. And most importantly, remember that the issue with this crisis and this shock is that this shock hit the corporate sector very hard. And the implication was that the corporate sector needed liquidity. The corporate sector needed to raise money and they needed to issue more triple B, issue more IG, issue more high yield and get loans very quickly. Or if you didn't have access to credit markets, you need to draw on your revolver, on your credit line with your bank. And this was very different from 2008 and 2009, where the problems were not the corporate sector. The corporate sector was actually in really good shape in 2008 and 2009, very broadly speaking, relative to this shock hitting at the heart of the corporate sector. So that's why financing for corporates was so important. And remember, in the US, 80% of borrowing in corporates comes from credit markets and only 20% comes from banks. This is the reverse of in Europe. In Europe, 80% of borrowing comes from banks and 20% comes from corporate bond markets. That's why the Fed, honestly, it really had very other little other choice than to support corporate bond markets and triple B markets simply because it was such an important part of financing to corporates and it was such an important part of getting corporates liquid and making sure that they could be, so to speak, carried over the river and through the pandemic and stay afloat uh, while we are waiting for the virus to be behind us. Right, fantastic. Um, focusing for a second on inflation, and I, I do mean that the questions are coming in fast, so I'm going to try and thematically group them, but I really want to get to as many of them. So if I jump around a little bit, I apologize in advance, but um, this is a bit of a one-two combo. I'm combining two questions in one, um, and obviously related to inflation. Do you think that COVID might have significantly or materially or even permanently lowered our star? And within that context, if we do think that there's going to be some form of a big fiscal stimulus, how will the Fed justify either increasing QE or changing the wham on these purchases if our star really did go down, so to speak? Yeah, so this is a very important question also. So it is, it is a significant risk that the longer this shark lasts, our star is going to be lower. Uh, the formal estimates would certainly say that it is lower already. 
uh, this is another different way of saying that uh, the Fed is getting closer and closer to the zero lower bound. And if you get closer and closer to the zero lower bound and the Fed has, for good reasons, been unwilling to almost entertain the idea of going negative, which I think makes a lot of sense. So if that's the case, that means that a lot of the burden then goes exactly to fiscal policy. It is honestly somewhat unusual that you have central banks around the world, the Fed, ECB, basically telling politicians, can you please go and spend some more money? Can we please get a fiscal expansion? I mean, normally central banks would sit around and say, please do not spend so much money. Please make sure that the fiscal side and debt sustainability is taken care of. But the fact that the central banks are now switching because of the low R star and because of the weak inflation and because of the weak numbers we've had in the economy and because we have still such a significant output gap, they have been switching more to fiscal policy to say, well, we can't really do more to the economy than we already are doing, which is a lot. But therefore, if fiscal policy can come and help us, that would be incredibly helpful. That's why for markets, the issue is so incredibly important because now if Trump is re-elected or if Biden is elected, I mean, whoever is becomes the new president and whatever happens after November the 3rd, if we do get a fiscal expansion, which is the most likely scenario, and no matter what the outcome is, then you should also begin to worry about uh, that. what are the implications of that from a GDP perspective and uh, worry in this sense that that would mean that you should change your forecast. So the election outcome and here in this case, the fiscal expansion combined with the virus means that uh, compared to this sort of relatively uh, difficult situation we're in at the moment where I have several times said the data is moving sideways, we could have a very significant change to the economic outlook in 2021 if we do get a big fiscal expansion and if we also get a vaccine. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I think this question is probably uh, more of a personal opinion than anything else. But um, given the fact that capital markets are now, and this is a verbatim question, I think it's asked uh, perfectly as is, so I'm not going to paraphrase, but uh, are capital markets now so centrally controlled by central banks that ultimately this is, so to speak, a, slow, a dying a slow death of sorts? Is lower yields uh, with higher risk, ultimately a game of chicken where we're going to hit an end point at some point in time. And obviously, does that obviously end badly? Is, is that something that you're thinking about and, and putting into your own calculus? So a, a, a very simple way of saying that is that it really is the case that the Fed basically controls all bond markets in the US. Think about bond markets. And here we're talking about treasuries, we're talking about mortgages, we're talking about credit. And of course, there's some parts of credit that are not controlled, but of course, everything moves in sync in most markets. It may not move, as I show with some of the charts with spreads one to one, but it's pretty clear that the central banks globally have a significant impact on essentially all bond markets and rates markets uh, in, in a very, very significant way. And if you look at the correlation between US markets and the rest of the world, you certainly also get a very clear impression that the Fed is actually not only controlling US markets, but also having a very significant impact, at least in a correlation sense with what's going on elsewhere. And what are the implications of that? Well, one very important implication is, as I mentioned with the little arrow and the hunt for yield, is that the investors look at the level of the Treasury rates and the level of the Fed funds rate and the ECB rates and the BOJ rates and say, OK, uh, I'm a pension fund, I'm an insurance company, I'm supposed to generate a three, four, five, six percent on my fixed income portfolio. That's really difficult to get at the moment. So that's why um, the willingness and uh, the, the appetite that people have been forced to hunt more yield has been a very important name of the game for now 10 years. And it seems that this continues. Then to the core of the question is, OK, cool, so what can reverse this? And as I mentioned, there are two things that can reverse this, either if the risk free rate goes up, because if I could get the three, four, five percent in the Fed funds rate as a risk free rate, for whatever reason, why would I then be allocating significant amounts to other things that right. I'm today investing in to get those returns? So the risk free rate going up or fundamentals in the E and the PE ratio being low or fundamentals in credits and cash flows in companies could also begin to then topple and people say, wow, these things are really expensive. But I mean, we saw the PE ratio in S&P go up to. 25 point, I mean, 25 overall on, on the multiple for the PE. And that was just um, still very, very overvalued relative to historical patterns, but the market still has been willing to buy even at these levels. So it's a, it's a difficult question to ask, when does the music stop, uh, given um, how significant the hunt for yield now is again? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and thank you for that answer. But then uh, another question that came out during your explanation, would you argue or how would one argue then are we seeing the end result of the 60-40 allocation, the sort of set it and forget it that we've all sort of experienced over the last five, if not 10 years? Well, if uh, the bond 
market, broadly speaking, now has returns that are expected to be very, very low, then from my MBA finance textbook, if I have one asset that I thought normally would go up and down, and maybe I had some idea that it would actually go up and down in, in reverse relative to my equities, then uh, now suddenly you have one asset class that's hitting the lower, zero lower bound. And if the lower bound is being hit, then I can't get 10 year rates to go down much more. Maybe they can hit zero, but uh, I mean, that's, that's what I wouldn't expect that. But I mean, that means that there is really no longer a hitch what you get in rates. So that's just opening up again. Uh, we have to get several chapters down your know, finance textbook to then begin to think about what are the implications if suddenly bonds have changed the nature from no longer being an asset that you can get at least in rates, much return in relative to what I could historically. That's why, again, from a quant perspective, running regressions and fancy principal component analysis, which I'm completely in for, I, I love it all. I think it's fantastic statistical tools, but you've got to think really hard about what is the data sample period that I'm using? And is that sample period representative for what I want to do with the future? And this is the challenge that if the level of rate stays so low, then to your 40, 60 question, then bonds are just no longer what they used to be. Right. Yeah, they could very well be an anchor to the uh, portfolio performance. Uh, drifting off of that for a second, certainly on the on the fixed income side, you'd mentioned, you know, one of the, uh, the issues when you were looking at your chart that was going from left to right was higher inflation. Uh, diving into that for a second, what if, and we saw this in the beginning of COVID when we had really supply constraints affecting inflation, it wasn't necessarily demand induced inflation, just simply we cannot get product or let's say raw materials through the pipeline to where it is, either if it's coming from other countries, other side of the country, or just down the road. Uh, what if we start seeing, let's call it supply induced inflation, which can be seen as transitory as opposed to really sort of, you know, really getting into the DNA. What do you think the Fed would do during, during those times? Would they see it as, as I said before, this is all transitory, transitory, or will they start to say, listen, that's just the new rules of the game? I, so I, we, I think it, and it's a fair question. We are already seeing that. The issue is that those parts of the CPI basket that represent this supply chain challenge are actually relatively small components. If you add up everything that could be impacted from a supply chain perspective, you only get that that makes up roughly in round numbers. And here I'm thinking about trade in, say, uh, everything from PVP equipment and medical devices and other things that uh, ventilators, other things to where you could start to say, this is a challenge and the price of these things could potentially go up. Even supply chain, if you include the auto industry, you get that those components only make up around 10% of the CPI basket. So one very important part of that question is that inflation is not only driven by that issue as much as that issue is important for certain segments of the CPI basket. Very, very broadly, the answer to your question is that there are many drivers of inflation and the Phillips curve or the Fed's framework and purpose, the Fed's model of the US economy would say that inflation is driven by the unemployment rate, meaning the capacity in the economy, given that's high, there's not much wage pressure at the moment, there's not much inflation pressure, so that's definitely holding inflation down. Inflation expectations have also been reasonably well anchored. I do appreciate they've gone up, but that's not going up dramatically either. Oil prices and the dollar, not much sign of impacting inflation overall. So those traditional variables are not going to drive inflation much higher. And then we go outside the box or outside firms and the Fed's model, exactly. Then maybe supply chain issues could lift some components of inflation. And finally, money printing could maybe also have some implications, but for that to work, money printing historically has only impacted inflation once money printing was impacting GDP transactions. But today, money printing really goes into instead asset price transactions. That's why a lot of the buying of IG and a lot of the buying of treasuries ends up lifting asset prices and therefore financial markets rather than lifting consumer prices. So the short answer to your question is that if I look across the components of drivers of inflation, and even those that are outside the box in terms of the Fed's framework for inflation, I still have a hard time seeing much upward pressure on inflation anytime soon, except of course in these little areas of supply chain, which certainly could have an impact on certain segments, but that will not at the macro level be driving inflation higher. Excellent. Pivoting a little bit, if, if you will, and maybe uh, three three or four more questions. I know we're cresting an hour, but if you're okay with it, I would love to just shoot one a few more. Um, what's your outlook for commercial real estate, particularly in, uh, let's say, you know, larger cities like New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, things of that nature? So, of course, the challenge is uh, literally here, uh, working from home like you and me today is, of course, the issue that we need to debate is, 
when are we going to come back? Uh, when will the virus um, be behind us? Um, and not only in terms of office space, everything that goes with hotels, apartments, the whole strip malls, everything that goes into commercial real estate is obviously, um, from a broad perspective, distressed at the moment. Um, if you think a vaccine is coming around uh, quickly, then uh, then things are certainly cheap today. If you think that a vaccine will take a long time, then of course it's also going to take a long time for some of these assets to go back. So there are certainly important segments within the different parts that I just mentioned. Uh, but very broadly speaking, a lot of uh, the, the discussion around to what extent commercial real estate is attractive today or not really ends up being a discussion around when do you think we will have a vaccine that will be enough to bring us back to work, to bring people to shop at shopping malls again, to bring people to stay at hotels, and all the issues that go into what is being held back by the virus at the moment. So for better or worse, and I appreciate there's a lot of granularity you can debate around this specific issue, but the broad answer is, for better or worse, that the virus will be driving whether real estate, to, or commercial real estate, I'm sorry, is a good investment opportunity today or not. Right, 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 right. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going in the home stretch now, but there, there, there's some really gems out here. In, in a few words, thoughts on the on the dollar overall? I know you said that it's a, obviously a major component in that left to right valuation uh, schema, but top of mind, I know you you ruminate a, 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 on it a lot, but top of mind direction of USD over the next three to six months. I would say that if you think about the broadest framework for thinking about the dollar, I mean, those variables that always are significant in equations that try to estimate where the dollar is going, and here I'm talking about the trade weighted dollar more broadly, that is the following, namely, first of all, interest rate differential between the US and the rest of the world. Given US rates just came down dramatically, remember 10-year rates used to be plus 2%, now, yeah. basic 10 year rates are 70 basis points. So, therefore, we have had a significant compression of the spread between bonds and treasuries, likewise, also with Japanese rates. So, that means that from that perspective, US rates and the spread to the rest of the world are lower. That says that the dollar should be going down. The current account deficit is still here. There are some issues around what's been happening with the current account deficit, and you could spend some time thinking about how much is energy and what's other things. But the main conclusion, we still have a current account deficit. So both the short run driver of the dollar says, which is the interest rate differential says that the dollar should go down, and the longer run driver in the medium term, namely the current account balance and the trade deficit, also says that the dollar should go down. So I would say and over the near term, meaning the next three to six months, a uh, gradual de depreciation of the dollar would be the baseline scenario. Wonderful. Last two, I promise. Um, if given the choice between adjusting WAMs or increasing LSAT, what do you think the Fed will do? Yeah, so I, that's a really good question, and I didn't answer that earlier when you asked it last time, so thanks for bringing it up again. The Fed and both Clarita and Powell and a number of other FOMC speakers have been very clear that the level of 10-year rates today I mean, it's almost as if you ask the question, why should we go out and buy 10-year or 30-year bonds at the moment when you have the 10-year rates are already so low? In that sense, uh, you don't get too much at this point out of taking a rabbit out of the hat that you might need later. The problem is that if rates do start to go up, let's say 10-year rates go to 100 basis points, and then you bring the rabbit out of the hat and say, now we're going to buy the long end. People might begin to say, well, wait a minute, uh, why are you buying long rates now? Is this uh, to try to limit any negative impact on the economy? Is there any other issues to have to do with fiscal policy? What are the motivations why this is happening? So it's a very tricky thing for the Fed here to signal that they are willing and absolutely thinking hard about what should they do further on the curve. But this becomes a very important debate about what is the actual level of where yields are today. So if 10-year rates stay at these levels, I would not expect that you would see any uh, significant increase in uh, purchases further out the curve because there's simply no need to do that. Uh, so I think that the, the 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 tricky thing in this discussion is that it depends a lot on what tenure rates are doing and whether the tenure rates are normalizing because the economy is normalizing or whether tenure rates are going up because people start worrying about uh, too much fiscal expansion and too much issuance of treasuries. Right, right. Effectively, almost uh, the crowding out concept. And last one, and thank you so much for taking all these. Um, and we're going to hold your feet to the fire a little bit on this one, if you don't mind, and obviously answer Please. as you deem uh, deem appropriate. So, are we uh, are we early cycle or are we in a recession right now? And given that context, in your opinion, what do you think is the best risk adjusted trade right now? So I would say very broadly. So I did tiptoe around that issue. So it, it, it's all fair to ask that very good question. 
I would say that question depends a lot on your horizon. If you have a horizon that is three, five, or whatever, 10 years, and you're a real money manager, and you're thinking about what is the outlook over the next many years, then it's totally clear that things are cheap today. There's certainly a number of distress opportunities in certain parts of financial markets. If on the other hand, you have a shorter horizon and you write quarterly newsletters to your investors, then there are certainly some arguments for saying it's just probably a little bit too early because if the economic data could get weaker over the next several months, as I said, because the economy is not probably not going to do particularly well when the virus is still here, then some of these things that you could look at and investing in today could probably be cheaper in a month or two or three months. And then when we get more clarity about the design and the size of the fiscal package, and when we get more clarity about the vaccine, then you could begin to take more risk and be more opportunistic about saying, okay, now I'm willing to say that things are getting better. So I would say the answer to that, and that's not, not to uh, shortcut yeah. and still convey any answer, but it's just to say the answer to that depends a lot on what your investment horizon is and whether you are willing to now say some things are cheap and everyone is worried about certain segments of financial markets. And when people are worried, that's of course also the time when things are distressed and when you should think about, well, what is my horizon? Do I think these things will normalize over time or not? Wonderful. Honestly, Torsten, thank you so much. That, this was uh, this was beyond belief, and we're very, very appreciative. And we thank also our audience for uh, uh, for joining us in this really deep conversation, and for Torsten leading us through the, his thought process. Uh, with that, uh, we thank Torsten. We thank everybody else, and uh, we look forward to our next event, which will be in November. Uh, details to follow very shortly. Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it, and thanks again, Torsten. Thanks for having me. Bye.